We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. America's leap into the space age began with seven volunteer pilots of Project Mercury. They spent two years training for a flight that no one had ever made before, aboard a vehicle that was little more than a ballistic missile. And to the world, they introduced a new word, astronaut. Today, a space launch is practically routine. The United States Space Shuttle flies with such frequency that its missions seem almost commonplace and attract little public attention. To most Americans, a shuttle's orbital flight is just another trip around the block. It's hard to imagine what it was like in the 1950s when putting a man in space was still science fiction. The astronaut today is the Buck Rogers of yesterday. By the late 1950s, however, the world stood at the edge of a new era, waiting for someone willing to take the first step. In the autumn of 1957, Soviet technicians were making the final adjustments to a large metal sphere they called Sputnik. On the morning of October the 4th, it was placed in the nose of a powerful rocket and launched into space. Fifteen minutes later, Sputnik began circling the Earth as the world's first artificial satellite. The device was hardly impressive, but the Soviet achievement was astounding. The Soviets were first in space. It was one of the great propaganda coups of the Cold War. The world was shocked and America's pride was devastated. The United States could hear Sputnik's radio signal each time it passed overhead while in orbit. The indignity of playing second fiddle to the Soviets was unacceptable. So in July 1958, President Eisenhower signed a bill in Congress to create the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, which would lead America's scientific exploration of space. NASA's first priority was to investigate the feasibility of manned space flight. The reasoning was simple. If the Russians had put the first satellite in orbit, then America must be the first to put a man in orbit. And so Project Mercury was born. In October 1958, a space task group was established to manage the program and decide how best to put the first American in space. And then determine just who that American would be. By the new year, the call was out to find the first space pilots. On April the 9th, 1959, NASA introduced seven young pilots to the national press as the astronaut volunteers of Project Mercury. Before a room full of reporters and photographers, the men on stage were presented as national heroes. NASA well understood the value of good publicity and the press ate it up. Each pilot possessed qualities that were best suited for America's first astronauts. On a professional level, they boasted impressive military careers. On a personal level, they led model lives as husbands and fathers. As a group, 
they formed NASA's dream team. Most of the astronauts had only just met each other that morning. They were Donald Slayton, Alan Shepard, Walter Schirrar, Virgil Grissom, John Glenn, Gordon Cooper and Scott Carpenter. Donald Slayton, better known as Deke, was an Air Force captain. He flew in World War II and was one of the top test pilots at Edwards Air Force Base. Virgil, or Gus Grissom, also an Air Force captain, had flown in combat against Russian MiGs in the Korean War before becoming a test pilot. Gordo Cooper, the third Air Force officer, was a captain and, like Slayton, he flew at Edwards. Alan Shepard, a lieutenant commander in the Navy, had earned a reputation for his expertise in aircraft carrier landings. At the Navy's test pilot school at Patuxent River, Maryland, he test flew the Navy's fastest and deadliest combat aircraft. Wally Shira, another lieutenant commander, served in Korea before joining the Navy's test flight program. Scott Carpenter, a Navy lieutenant, was also a veteran of the Korean War. And John Glenn, a Marine lieutenant colonel, had served in both World War II and Korea. He'd flown nearly 150 combat missions and was responsible for downing three Russian MiGs. Seven seasoned test pilots, delirious from the frenzy of light bulbs, cameras and questions. A test pilot was by nature a man of steel. He didn't scare easily. Flying in the face of death was his business. But when faced with a row of cameras, the new astronauts became nervous wrecks. The Mercury 7 would become overnight heroes, the new hope for leading America into space and leaving the Russians behind. Living up to that responsibility would be their greatest challenge. Three weeks after their celebrated debut, the Mercury astronauts reported to NASA's center at Langley Field in Virginia. Langley was their home base, but they would travel widely across the United States during the training period. One of their first trips was to the McDonnell Aircraft Plant in St. Louis, Missouri, where the Mercury space capsule was under development. A difficult thing to get used to was the fact that it had no wings, and the idea of blasting off crammed in the nose cone of a rocket seemed more like a stunt than anything else. The astronauts wanted to be in control, not just along for the ride. A more appealing means of getting into space was the X-15, an experimental plane being developed by the Air Force to reach extreme speeds and altitudes. To a test pilot, this seemed like the way to go. The X-15 was essentially a rocket with wings. It was outfitted with control surfaces like a regular aeroplane. But as pilots would quickly learn, a control surface would become useless in the vacuum of space. NASA believed the Mercury capsule was a faster, simpler and safer way to put a man in orbit. Engineers decided that a blunt cone design would be best for a manned satellite. When re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, the bell-shaped capsule would cause enough resistance to slow the capsule's descent and thus protect the astronaut from damaging acceleration or temperatures. In orbit, small rocket motors would be used for control, while reverse rockets at the base would slow the capsule for its return to Earth. The Mercury capsule had to be small and light enough to fit on top of existing rocket boosters, but large enough to hold the pilot. The blunt base of the capsule was covered with layers of fiberglass resin to act as a heat shield. 
During re-entry, it would burn off, absorbing the intense heat caused by the friction of passing through Earth's atmosphere at over 27,000 kilometers per hour. The inside of the capsule was about as roomy as a telephone booth. It was originally designed to operate on fully automated controls. This had made the astronauts feel more like passengers than pilots. Instead, they insisted that there be a manual override to the control system, should the automation fail at any time during orbital flight. A manual control stick would be integrated into the capsule soon after the astronauts left the McDonnell plant. To land back on Earth, the capsule would descend by parachute and splash down into the ocean. The name capsule was later dropped. The astronauts had pushed for a better term. Spacecraft. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union was determined to put a man in orbit before the Americans. It did not select its astronauts, however, until February 1960, nearly one year after America had already picked its Mercury 7. The training was somewhat similar, but Russia's astronauts had far less flying experience than the Americans, and they had no role in the development of their spacecraft. In fact, the Soviet cosmonaut considered himself lucky if he even got to look at his capsule after six months of training. The Vostok spacecraft, as it was called, was designed by Sergei Korolev. Korolev also built the Soviets' first rocket boosters that had launched the Sputnik satellite. Vostok weighed over three times more than the Mercury spacecraft. In May 1960, it was placed into orbit carrying a mannequin on its first test flight. That was two months before America would even launch its first Mercury Atlas. The Mercury astronauts had little time to worry about the space race. Besides, information on the Soviet program was sketchy at best. Instead, they got on with their work and seldom looked over their shoulders. The better part of 1960 was spent training in a variety of simulators. The centrifuge exposed the astronauts to the high gravity loads that would be experienced during spaceflight. Another device simulated the spacecraft's attitude control system. The astronaut would be able to manually change the yaw, pitch and roll of the Mercury capsule by operating a hand controller. A multiple axis spinner was designed to simulate the conditions of a spacecraft tumbling out of control. A man was strapped into a couch and then rotated on three different axes. With a control stick, the astronaut had to dampen the motion in each axis and re-stabilize the whole contraption. Each astronaut would have a personally contoured couch installed in the Mercury spacecraft. When launched aboard a Mercury rocket, the astronaut would experience tremendous forces of gravity that would increase his body weight many times. This personal couch would protect the astronaut from gravity forces or G-loads of up to 20 times his own weight. Here, John Glenn is sitting in his couch under 14 G-loads in the centrifuge. Alan Shepard, as he experiences the G-loads of an emergency abort and landing. 
To take such a physical beating, the Mercury 7 had to be conditioned like athletes. Underwater swimming required a physical discipline that was highly effective in training for spaceflight. It was also a favourite for Navy men like Wally Shira and Alan Shepard. Weightlessness could be duplicated in an aircraft for just under a minute by flying in a powered parabolic curve. Before they could fly into space, the astronauts would have to learn to function completely in a weightless environment. Until 1950, Cape Canaveral had been little more than a narrow strip of marshland. By 1960, it had a nickname, Spaceport USA. The Mercury 7 picked up their bags once more and relocated to the Cape. Towns like Cocoa Beach were growing rapidly as neighbourhoods began filling up with workers from NASA. By now, the astronauts were true celebrities. The national press tried to follow them wherever they went and usually succeeded. Everything was a photo op. Most of them felt uncomfortable and awkward in front of cameras, but they were treated just like movie stars. Since that first press conference, they'd suffered an onslaught of media attention. Life magazine secured exclusive rights to cover their personal lives. Like it or not, they were presented as national heroes, and the public would accept nothing less. Numerous failures in flight test were plaguing the Mercury project. The program was already a year behind schedule when the first Mercury Atlas was ready for firing in July 1960. It was the first to carry a real Mercury spacecraft. But one minute into the flight, the rocket exploded. The weight of the Mercury capsule had stressed the walls of the Atlas beyond capacity. A delay of several months would pass before the failure was sorted out, a delay the American space program could not afford. April the 12th, 1961. The Soviets had done it again. Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin is thrust skyward aboard a giant five-stage booster high above the plains of Central Asia. Inside his Vostok capsule, the first man in space will make nearly one orbit before re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. After the Vostok parachute is released, Gagarin ejects as designed. Both cosmonaut and capsule then descend to Earth unharmed. The Russians reveled in the glory of Gagarin's flight. They had beaten the Americans again. So far, the space race barely resembled a contest. The Mercury 7 spent a week in the deserts of Nevada for survival training in July 1960. By now they'd become a tight-knit group, secure in the knowledge that together they were treading a new path of discovery. 
and they were becoming good friends along the way. When word of the Russian space flight reached the Mercury team, it was less than a month away from launching one of its own. NASA would not say which astronaut had been selected. The choice had been made as early as January the 20th, 1961. But the public was kept in the dark until hours before the scheduled launch, when Project Mercury was finally ready to send the first American into space. The moment of truth arrived on May the 5th, 1961. The Mercury astronaut appeared in his silvery spacesuit just before dawn. Six stories up, his Mercury spacecraft was perched above the Redstone booster. The astronaut was Alan Shepard. He'd begun the morning just after 1 a.m with breakfast and a full physical examination. By 5.30, he would be inside the spacecraft. Each of the other six astronauts had their roles to play. Shepard's backup pilot was John Glenn. Glenn also made the final checks on the spacecraft. Cooper was stationed in the launch blockhouse, where he and Grissom maintained voice contact with Shepard. Both Carpenter and Shira took off in F-106s to make aerial observations of the flight. All of Shepard's telemetry data and systems information would be received at Mercury Control, the nerve center of the whole operation. Here, Deke Slayton would be the capsule communicator, or CAPCOM, during the entire flight. This was actually the third launch attempt. Bad weather had cancelled the first two tries. This morning saw another delay, an electrical glitch that stopped the countdown and kept Shepard waiting patiently for nearly four hours. Finally, the countdown resumed, and at 9.49 a.m., it reached zero. Redstone booster pushed skyward, climbing to speeds of over 8,000 kilometers per hour. Shepard was pressed back into his seat by the tremendous force. Vibration in his spacecraft was severe. He could barely read the instruments as the rocket climbed to over 160 kilometers above the Earth. Fifteen minutes later, helicopters recovered Shepard and his spacecraft in the Atlantic Ocean. 500 kilometers downrange from Cape Canaveral. Shepard's spacecraft, which he named Freedom 7, had functioned perfectly. Manual and automatic controls had operated smoothly. And best of all, it had carried its pilot home safely. President John F. Kennedy decorated Alan Shepard at the White House and hailed him as America's space pioneer. I thought that last Friday was a thrilling day. Today even surpasses last Friday. And as a matter of fact, I got far less sleep last night than I did the night before the flight. <laughs> Washington, D.C. cheered Shepard on the streets. NASA had delivered on its promise to send a man into space. But there were six more astronauts, each awaiting his own chance to become a hero. Project Mercury scheduled the next flight for July 1961. For the next Mercury flight, the spacecraft was modified. A window was added, and the side hatch was equipped with an exploding device for emergency exits. Gus Grissom was the second astronaut to fly. His spacecraft, called Liberty Bell 7, was launched aboard a Redstone booster. <laughs> 
Like Shepard, Grissom made a suborbital flight. Reaching an altitude of 188 kilometers, he crossed the threshold of space in a wide ballistic arc. The flight went perfectly, but within minutes of his return, disaster would strike. Gus Grissom's returning spacecraft passed through Earth's atmosphere without incident. The parallels to Alan Shepard's flight were impressive, but disaster awaited. Liberty Bell 7 reached the recovery area and splashed down without error. It was a pretty hard hit, even with the air cushioned landing bag. Grissom was never comfortable in the water. He could barely see the recovery helicopter as the capsule heaved up and down in the open ocean. But Grissom was known for his fast thinking in complex situations. As the helicopter got ready to hook on to the spacecraft, he signaled them to wait five minutes while he marked down some instrument readings. Five minutes had passed, the chopper hooked onto the spacecraft. Normal procedure called for lifting the capsule out of the water. The astronaut would then open the hatch, climb out and grab onto a harness to be hauled aboard the helicopter. But suddenly, the explosive hatch blew prematurely before the chopper had begun lifting. Water started pouring into the spacecraft and Grissom scrambled out. As the chopper strained to lift the overloaded capsule, the astronaut's spacesuit began taking in water. Grissom was about to drown. A second helicopter moved in to save the astronaut. While Grissom struggled into the harness, the first chopper, overtaxed by nearly 500 kilos, appeared to be failing. Finally, Grissom was hauled to safety but his spacecraft, Liberty Bell 7, was lost. 38 years would pass before it would finally be recovered. Grissom later claimed that the hatch escape mechanism had malfunctioned. Others claimed he had panicked and blew the hatch manually. It made an unfortunate ending to an otherwise perfect flight. It's the evening of February the 19th, 1962. Americans are anxiously awaiting reports on the weather situation at Cape Canaveral. America's first orbital flight is only hours away. John Glenn has been selected to be the first American to circle the Earth. But one month of delays have kept him on hold. Bad weather was partly to blame, but so was the readiness of the Mercury Atlas booster. The first scheduled launch was scrubbed because of problems with the propellant tanks. On another date, a leak was discovered and a further 10 days were lost. February the 20th, however, is the date, the defining moment for both NASA and the Mercury team. Nearly one year has passed since the Russians sent Gagarin into orbit. Now, finally, it is America's chance. And John Glenn's too. Unlike Gagarin, Glenn is climbing into his spacecraft as a pilot. Whereas the Russian travelled in a fully automated capsule, the Mercury astronaut will actually control the pitch, yaw and roll of his spacecraft. Public support is overwhelming. National TV news crews and over 600 reporters have endured the numerous delays to witness the launch. The mighty Atlas is freed from its tower and the countdown has begun. The engine is about to be fired. Glenn's spacecraft called Friendship 7 is alerted by fellow astronaut Scott Carpenter. 
nearly 160,000 kilos of flaming thrust hurls the astronaut skyward. Mission Control watches the rocket approach max Q, maximum dynamic pressure, where the forces of flight and ascent are strongest. The Atlas rattles under the pressure. Soon, Friendship 7 will separate from the booster engine. Then, Glenn and America will be in orbit. As cheers for John Glenn erupt across the Mercury team, the astronaut settles in for his first quick trip around the Earth. As his Mercury 7 teammates monitor Glenn's progress around the planet, a routine report masks a very serious problem. Back at Cape Canaveral, Mission Control has received a warning signal indicating that the heat shield of Friendship 7 might be loose. If Glenn re-enters the atmosphere without this protective shield, he and his ship will burn up. The signal on the ground may be an error, Glenn's spacecraft reports that systems are normal. Shepard, Slayton and the rest of the control team cannot be sure, but they must think fast. Re-entry will occur in less than four hours. As Friendship 7 completes its first orbit, all efforts on the ground are focused on saving the astronaut. Glenn is unaware of the crisis, and ground control decides to keep it that way. By the third and last orbit, one proposal stands out. The retro rocket pack, designed to slow the spacecraft for re-entry, is strapped to the outside of the heat shield it may be strong enough to hold the shield in place. Glenn is approaching the California coast. Time to kick out of orbit. The retro rocket burst slows Friendship 7 for its downward slide into the atmosphere. Normal procedure calls for the astronaut to discard the retro pack, but at ground control a crucial decision is made. By keeping the retro pack on, its metal straps might secure the heat shield, that is, if the pack doesn't burn up first. If it does, then the first American to orbit the Earth will return in cinders. Uh, this is Friendship 7. Now, what is the reason for this? Do you have any reason? Over. None at this time. This is the judgment of deep flight. Uh, while you're doing that, uh, we're not sure whether or not your landing bag has deployed. Uh, we feel it's far safer to re-enter uh, with the retro package on. Uh, we see no difficulty at this time in that type of re-entry. Over. Uh, Roger. Understand. Friendship 7 plunges into the atmosphere 
at over 27,000 kilometers per hour. External temperatures climb to nearly 4,000 degrees. They cannot hear him. A layer of ionized air has enveloped the spacecraft, blocking any communication. They feel helpless. All they can do is wait, together, while their friend is alone. Alan Shepard, on Capcom, keeps calling for the astronaut. Then, out of the silence... The voyage of Friendship 7 ended safely. Its captain, astronaut John Glenn, represented a new kind of explorer, a star voyager who had sailed the vast ocean of space. His triumph was America's triumph, earning national praise for the whole Mercury team. John Glenn received a hero's welcome everywhere he went. New York had not seen such a celebration since Charles Lindbergh's flight across the Atlantic. Right now, the gantry is being pulled back from the bird. The big silver Atlas rocket will be standing. Mercury continued to make orbital flights throughout the spring of 1963, with each astronaut blazing a new trail for America. Scott Carpenter made Mercury's second orbital flight. Like John Glenn, he would circle the Earth three times. But Carpenter's mission would include scientific experiments. It was time to put man to work in space. Scientists at NASA were eager to use Carpenter's spacecraft, which he named Aurora 7, as a platform for scientific observations. Aurora 7 was launched on May the 24th, 1962. Carpenter performed a variety of experiments that included photographing the Earth's horizon and studying the limitations of color perception in space. The gains in space science, however, were not without sacrifice. Overworked with his experiments, Carpenter kicked out of orbit three seconds too late and overshot the planned recovery area by 400 kilometers. Nearly three hours had passed before the astronaut was located and hauled aboard the search helicopter. The flight of Aurora 7 taught a valuable lesson. The Mercury astronaut could not be overloaded with scientific experiments and still be expected to do his best job flying the spacecraft. 
The next stop was Wally Shira, who made sure his flight plan was kept manageable. He didn't want to repeat Carpenter's experience, especially since Shira was supposed to fly twice as long. As the fifth American in space, Shira would orbit the Earth six times. He named his spacecraft Sigma 7 and it was launched on October the 3rd, 1962. Like Carpenter, Shira made scientific observations from his spacecraft. His six orbit mission covered a quarter of a million kilometers in nine hours and 13 minutes. The astronaut gave top priority to his responsibility as a space pilot and because of this his spacecraft landed less than eight kilometers from the center of the recovery area. The United States fifth astronaut standing now in the window section and looking down now looking at the top of his capital. Sigma 7's extended flight paved the way for Mercury's final mission. Gordo Cooper would be the first American to spend a day in space. Cooper named his spacecraft Faith 7 and it blasted off on May the 15th, 1963. The 22 orbit mission would demonstrate man's ability to eat, drink and sleep in space. Cooper himself demonstrated much more. During the 19th orbit, the 0.05 G light, which normally signals an increase in gravity, illuminated prematurely. This indicated a possible automatic control system failure. To his friends on the ground, the astronaut explained that the remainder of his flight must be made using manual control. When the time came, Cooper himself would have to fire the retro rockets and control the re-entry. After a 34-hour flight, Faith 7 reached the recovery area without error. Through his piloting skills, Cooper proved that the astronaut is an even more essential part of the overall spacecraft system. And his safe return on May the 16th brought Project Mercury to a close. The end of the Mercury project marked a new beginning. Its success encouraged new goals and higher ambitions. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. President Kennedy upped the stakes in the space race. America, he declared, must beat the Russians and be first to the moon. NASA produced Project Gemini, which paved the way for Apollo, the program that would fulfill Kennedy's pledge. As America pushed further out into space, the days of Mercury began to fade away. Scott Carpenter retired from NASA shortly after Project Mercury ended. Gordo Cooper flew once more aboard Gemini 5 before retiring. Gus Grissom flew in Gemini 3 and was rehearsing for the first manned Apollo flight when tragedy struck at the launch pad. Fire broke out in the capsule, killing Grissom and his crew. The Mercury 7 lost one of their most beloved members. Wally Shira flew aboard Gemini 6 and Apollo 7. The first American in space, Alan Shepard, made it to the moon aboard Apollo 14. Deke Slayton never got a Mercury flight. He was grounded for an irregular heartbeat. He later directed all flight crew operations for Gemini and Apollo. Then he finally got his chance to fly in 1975 aboard Apollo Soyuz, the first Russian-American docking in space. Slayton stayed with NASA until 1982, retiring just a year after the maiden voyage of the space shuttle. T minus 15.
In November 1998, America witnessed the triumphant return of an old Mercury veteran. John Glenn volunteered once more to serve America's space program 36 years after the orbital flight of Friendship 7. The celebrated launch echoed the spirit of those first ventures into space, when the hopes and dreams of all Americans rested on the shoulders of those seven dedicated test pilots, the astronauts of Project Mercury. <laughs>